Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives Podcast, formerly Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to health and well-being, featuring interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical health and mental health, and my five-minute food facts series. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host. I'm a lawyer turned nutritionist with a passion for learning from experts about how to live a vibrant life through practicing mindfulness and meditation, eating a nourishing healthy diet and moving my body and sharing what I learn with you here on this podcast. Before I introduce today's guest, I'll note that although I will often be speaking with experts, any information or advice provided in Vibrant Lives podcast is not intended to treat or cure medical conditions and it is never a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today I'm here with Jessica Lee. She's a neuro wellbeing writer and educator. She's passionate about sharing the fascinating world of the brain and how we can use neuroscience based strategies to find solutions, build resilience, lower stress, increase health, happiness, and creativity. She's founded The Spark Effect, where she helps purpose driven female entrepreneurs achieve their big business goals through the power of neuroscience, positive psychology, and well-being strategies. One of Jessica's areas of expertise is acceptance. And I think this is going to be a really special episode today because it's relevant to how the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted our lives. Jessica and I will chat about acceptance and in particular about how to accept change. Change in our lives can make us feel like we've lost our agency, like life is happening to us and we have no control over it. But Jess talks about how to accept change, which she calls empowered acceptance. I hope you enjoy this episode with Jessica Lee today. So today I'm here with Jessica Lee, and it's my great pleasure to be talking to her about things that I think will be very relevant to all of us living through the COVID-19 pandemic. So hi, Jessica. Hi, nice to be here. So just taking some inspiration from Tegan Taylor and Dr. Norman Swan's Corona cast, Quick Fire Friday, which I love, I thought I'd start <laughs> with some quick fire questions for you just to get to know a little bit about you. So Jess, where did you grow up? I grew up in Sydney in the Sutherland Shire. Oh, very nice. And what is your favourite form of exercise? Dancing. Dancing. Do you do that these days? Oh, trying to. Trying just to. In- the home office. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not quite as fun, is it, when you're doing it by yourself? No. Um, are you a dog or a cat person? Dog person. Oh, yes, so am I. No, I mean, there's nothing wrong with cats, of course. Um, <laughs> what is your go-to meal for dinner? Oh, I really love salmon. Yeah, great. So do I. Do you? Does your toddler like that too? He does, actually. Oh, he great. does. And what are you reading right now? So I'm reading two books, The Happiness Project for the second time. (laughs) Oh, yes, the Gretchen Rubin one. Yes. Yeah, I love that. And another book called Writing Down the Bones because I'm currently writing a book and I love reading about writing. (laughs) Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I think it's really helpful, actually. I've yeah. tried to write a book, but uh, anyway. It's, it's story. hard. It's it is very, hard. <laughs> very hard. And I admire anyone who can do it and not only write the book, but then get it published. Yep. <laughs> and what are you enjoying listening to at the moment? So music-wise, as I'm writing, I'm loving listening to sort of yoga style music mm-hmm. that's not got words, just get into that real flow state. Yeah. But in terms of podcasts, I, I'm a big fan of, of Jim Quick. So I don't know if you've come across him no, before. Lots of cool neuroscience oh, hacks great. there. Great. And a 15 minute podcast, really cool. Perfect. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Great. And Jess, your favorite holiday destinations um, within Australia, and if we can dream a bit uh, <laughs> outside Australia. <laughs> within Australia, I'm a big fan of the south coast of New South Wales, oh, down sort of in Jarvis Bay. I love love being by the ocean. Uh, favorite overseas. Uh, it has to be Paris, but I'd also love to get to Japan one day, hopefully. Oh, they're my two favourite destinations <laughs> as well. <laughs> okay. So today I'd like to talk about one of your areas of expertise, and that's acceptance. You say acceptance is about taking ownership of challenges and reclaiming the energy and inspiration to rebuild, reinvent, and recreate yourself 
and your life. So clearly there's a lot to discuss about acceptance. But let's start by understanding how your expertise and interest in this area developed. So what did you study at university? So I did a communications degree at UTS in Sydney and did an honours year where I looked at the role of hope in the lives of refugees. Wow, that's that's so interesting. So what inspired you to choose that topic? So I'd started to do some volunteer work with refugees. I'm not entirely sure what year it was now, but it was after September 11 where we started to see a lot more movement of people. Um, and so I started visiting some Iranian refugees in at Villawood Detention Centre and sitting with them and just Mm -hmm. listening and being supportive. I started cooking Persian food for them so that they (laughs) they could have a bit of home, you know, that sort of sense of home. And I I think it was a real a real moment for me in my life because I I grew up with so much privilege as we do in in Australia and to hear what they'd been through in their lives and um, wondering how do they keep going? How do they stay optimistic and hopeful and and that's that. So as soon as I had the chance to to do a thesis, I was really wanting to look at what is how does hope happen for yeah. refugees? How do they hold on to it? And you know, as we, we were sort of looking at the news at the moment with Afghanistan, yeah. it really just is all fresh. You know that um, yeah, <laughs> it's challenging. And did you find that people did manage to hold on to hope? Yeah, absolutely. Because the people I, I did a few life interviews of people who were living in Sydney. Yeah, they're all from Sydney now. And they just, they all had this vision and there was this concept of inactive and active hope. So, you know, when when we have active hope, we can, we can sort of do things to sort of move our life forward. But there are times in our life, and particularly for them, you know, in detention and things like that, where they just had to hold on to this type of inactive hope, where they sure. just continued to believe that it was possible and to keep looking for opportunities. So, one of the uh, refugees in a Sudanese refugee camp went and found all of the old textbooks that had found them what had found their way in the detention camp and taught himself how to read and how to do all these things. So these people who are really hopeful, they're just constantly looking for opportunity, even in pretty dire circumstances. And I, I think that's incredible. Yeah, it is amazing. And I guess one doesn't know how one would react until you're tested in that way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it must have been pretty inspiring, I'm sure. Yeah, it was. It definitely was. And then after um, graduating, you secured a highly sought after position at the Attorney General's Department. But six months in, you became really ill. So can you share with us, Jess, what happened? So during my honours year, I am um, very much a push type A sort of personality, yeah. high achiever. It's quite common amongst people who have the illness that I ended up with. Um, and I, I got glandular fever, but I didn't know it at the time. And I just pushed through and was quite, mm-hmm. quite unwell. And so when I got down to Canberra, I was, I was really sick and I just thought, oh, I'm just tired. And then I got a flu, just a simple flu. And, um, I just couldn't, couldn't operate. I couldn't stand up long enough to have a shower. Oh, I was wow. really dizzy. I couldn't shop for myself. There was quite a few times I'd have to abandon all my shopping in the middle of the shop and go home and just lay down. Um, so six months in after feeling you know, the fatigue and the brain fog and just everything. Um, I was told I had chronic fatigue syndrome. So I sort of thought it would only be a few months recovery. I left Canberra, moved back home to Sydney to live with my mum, hoping yeah. that a bit of good care would get me there. But it was actually a seven-year experience of coming back to, to good health. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was interesting because my thesis was about hope and it was very theoretical for me. Mm. But within a six-month period, I was actually using all of the things that I had learned about hope and staying optimistic in my own life. So it was, it was quite interesting in that sense. Yeah. Very interesting to put it to the test, but seven years is a very long time. Um, Yes. Yeah. That would have been (laughs) such a challenge. And I think also, well, chronic fatigue syndrome is not well understood, is it? No. No, No, it's not. And, you know, it's come a long way Mm -hmm. and, you know, it used to be called yuppie flu, which wasn't helpful. No. Um, But I was actually, you know, reading the other day that the the impacts even of COVID, we we see what they're calling long COVID, which is very much like chronic fatigue syndrome. So there is this hope that potentially as they learn more about that, that we might actually learn more about some of these other issues like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and things like that that would be really beneficial because coming up against the stigma was probably one of the harder parts of the the illness. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, I bet that kind of, as you say, people don't quite believe it's a thing because, well, we don't really know what causes it, but it's definitely yeah. real. I know someone else who's suffered that from it as well, and he was a type A personality, and <laughs> apparently he couldn't even walk to the letterbox. You know, it was, yep. yeah. Anyway, I believe yeah. he's recovered now as well. Um, so it was very obviously a life altering experience for you, Jess. And coming through that after seven years, you sort of needed to rebuild your life. And you talked a bit about on your website, you've mentioned some books that helped you do that. So can you share with us what those influential books were? Yeah, definitely. So one of them that I actually read for my honours thesis was Dr. Frank Frankel's book, Man's Search for Meaning, which is one of my all-time favourite books. And I guess whenever you're going through some, oh, you've got it. I'm holding oh, it up. And you've I got the most beautiful version too. I have, <laughs> and I haven't read it. And I have to say that um, it's going to be my next book of the month. You've inspired me mm. to read it. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a must must read and i think the reason for that you know other than just his beautiful wisdom but when we go through challenging situations i i always believe that perspective is really helpful so all the books that i really resonated with gave me perspective so like i said i'd just come out of talking with refugees about their the atrocities they'd been through so even though you know i was stuck in my bed unable to do very much at all I'd lost my job and back home with mom like a whole lot of things I still had that sense of perspective that it could be a lot worse yes and then when I read Dr um, Frankel's work you know he survived the holocaust so it doesn't get worse than that and he still had this wisdom and there was you know one quote that I just love he said everything can be taken from a man but one thing the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. Yeah. And that to me, if someone who has gone through that can say that, then I can hang on to that and believe that it's true. And so that really helped me. And then I read, read um, the diving bell on the butterfly. And that was incredible. This, this man who was fit and healthy ended yeah. up with a thing called locked in syndrome. And the only ability he had, he had a very active mind, but physically all he could do was blink one mm. eye, which I can't even imagine what that would be like. And he devised this system where he would blink based on the letter of the alphabet. And he wrote a book like that. Incredible. And I'm just like, wow, like I'd lost a lot of capacity in my life, but oh my goodness, I, listening to his story, I was like, I have so much still. Yeah. So what I what I felt from these two books was this sort of sense of gratitude, even amidst the struggle and a sense of perspective and a sense of moving from like a scarcity mindset more into an abundant mindset, Yeah. which was really helpful. Um, and the last book was Dr. John Arden's book, Rewire Your Brain. So when I was sick, I also experienced some anxiety because so much had changed. I also, um, my dad very suddenly passed away one night throughout that experience, which was tricky too. So a lot of my mm. life had just changed so quickly and there was no certainty of recovery and just a whole lot of grief and loss mixed in there. And so when I saw a psychologist to help me through all of the process of it, she introduced me to my brain <laughs> <laughs> through um, neuroscience. She was the best psychologist and that worked for me because I love to know why. Yes. And, and it's been <laughs> an ongoing, I would say, love affair with the brain ever since then. <laughs> <laughs> it has because it was the only thing that helped me because it's one thing to say to people like you need to change how you think, but when you start bringing into the concept of, okay, let's talk about the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and the su survival instinct, the mm. fight and flight response. For me, being able to really visualise what was happening in my brain and therefore knowing how I could change it and there was science behind it and it worked. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was a huge convert. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. So through that process, which obviously sounds extremely difficult, in including the death of your father, which is difficult in itself without everything else going on, you had to confront change. So most of us know that change can be extremely difficult, especially when it's something that's thrust upon us and we don't choose. Like, for example, illness or COVID lockdowns, which makes this chat relevant to today. So why do we often resist 
uh, in the face of change? Yeah, I I think when change is perceived as a positive, we probably don't resist. Yeah, like sure. if you were changing to live by the sea or something exciting. Mm-hmm. So it's obviously that perception that this is not a change for the better. And I think that what it does is it brings up a lot of uncertainty Mm -hmm. and a lot of fear. And going back to the brain, our brain doesn't really love gray area. It doesn't love, you know, likes black and white. It likes that sense of feeling like there's a level of control. And so when things like illness happen and things like snap lockdowns where we just don't have the time often to get our head around it or even this, there's nothing we can, we can do to change it, that there is that sense of helplessness and that creates a stress response in in our in our body and so I think that that's why we resist it because there's a part of us that's probably a tiny bit in denial as well it's like yeah. this this isn't happening I don't want it to happen I I just I'm not doing this <laughs> and um you know I guess for me with my illness for the first year I, I spent about ten thousand dollars looking for cures and treatments just desperate to get back to the old way and resisting that this illness was potentially here to stay. And it's a bit like the lockdown, like especially in Sydney at, you know, yeah. at the moment, like it's here to stay for a while. And so I think it's hard because we just want it to be different and we don't want to accept it because it, it yeah, it's hard. And so that creates a sense of suffering or pain, I believe. Yeah. So Jess, you talk about empowered acceptance and that is the key to broadening our perspective to create greater meaning and purpose in our lives. So can you talk us through the process? How do we go from that resistance to acceptance of change? Yeah. So I think when we when we face change where we can do something about it, then we do. Yeah. And then if it's change that we can't, then there's that choice of resistance and acceptance. And so the problem with that at least I've experienced in my life is that when we resist change that is happening is that it keeps us stuck in the past, stuck in what we wish was different. And for me through illness, it was really, it kept me focused on what I can't do. So, okay, I can't do a nine to five job. I can't exercise all the can'ts. Yes. And that has a real biological impact on our body when we're focusing on that sort of scarcity stuff. And so for me, empowered acceptance is about actually being quite real and going, this is, this is happening. And so how do I actually change the conversation around this? Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, I don't want this to be happening, it's about then saying, well, how could I make something of this? And this is where we bring in purpose and meaning. You know, if it's like, I can't do this, then it's asking yourself, well, how can I? So what happens is that we can move then into a type of solution mindset. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to move back to something that we probably can't go back to, or maybe we can't go back to for a while. It's about really taking a big deep breath in the present moment and saying, okay, what, how can we work with what we've got? What are the opportunities here? If I'm struggling, what do I need? If I need help, who do I ask? We don't just get stuck in the I can't do it. I don't want this. And so that's where I talk about empowered acceptance is that I feel like until we accept the reality of something, we can't move to that space of asking those questions of how do we live with this? And so for me, when I was sick, I, like I said, I spent a lot of time trying to get back to what I was. And then I was like, this isn't working. And then I vividly remember one day just you know, the bills were racking up <laughs> and I was like, I have to, to stop this. I have to actually accept that illness is here. Yeah. And the next question was, how do I live well with this illness? And so, you know, I think the same is true for, for other and other sort of challenges we yes. face or even lockdown is, is to really try and look for the opportunities and to really focus back on our capacity, our resourcefulness and the supports that we potentially have around us. Is part of that moving forward can part of it include a bit of a grieving process for letting go of the old you or the old situation or something like that? A hundred percent. And yeah. this is something that I am really passionate about because I actually really believe that to rise with resilience, we have to sort of unravel first. Yeah. And this was a, a big lesson I learned becoming a first time mum as well. You know, the times when I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. This is so challenging. I'm so tired. You know, I would literally sit on the bathroom floor and just 
cry it all out <laughs> and just feel so overwhelmed. And then I'd say, okay, Jess, you can do this. And I think even in lockdown, I have moments like that too, where I just go into that, that, that loss and that grief and the suffering that we are witnessing. And it, that release provides that little bit of space and it also lowers our stress hormones as well, but yeah. it's just, okay, I've released something and therefore there's a spaciousness. Without that release, I think it's really hard. So it, it creates that space for you to then move into, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And I think just to get more clarity on what um, empowered acceptance is, perhaps you can tell us what acceptance is not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I think it's a really common perception that acceptance is this notion of like giving up mm. or giving in. And I definitely came up against that when I, when I decided that I wasn't going to keep searching for this elusive cure or treatment, particularly for chronic fatigue syndrome at the time, there really wasn't any like gold standard for helping people. So I was like, oh, I've just got to stop. And so when I, and my decision was to invest my time and energy in creative expression. So painting and jewelry making and stuff that would actually boost joy in my immune system. But when I would talk to people and they'd say, oh, you've got to try this or see this doctor. And I'd say, no, I'm okay. Thanks. You know, for now yeah. they just, they did like, they look at you like, what are you, you giving up or something? And so it's not, it's not about that. It's actually just about giving yourself, I guess that, freedom to find find joy and to ask those different questions and to be okay with sometimes like in life things aren't going to plan yeah. um yeah so it's definitely it's definitely not giving up and if anything I think it's more optimistic because instead of becoming fixated and stuck in the past yeah. you're actually open to future possibilities which to be completely honest when you're resisting you do not even see those future possibilities yeah that's a really good point isn't it? Because you're, as you say, you're fixated on something that, that can't be changed. Yeah. And in the article I read, which is how I found out about you, it was in the Wellbeing <laughs> magazine, you enunciated five steps to empowered acceptance. And I know this is quite a complex subject and I'm sure you could talk for hours about it, but perhaps you can just give us an overview of what those steps are. Yeah, sure. So the first one is about reflecting. So I think sometimes when we're in a place of resistance, we're not even aware that we are. <laughs> but when you start to look at how your body feels and your thinking, you, you might just go, gosh, I am so agitated. And look, this is true for me in lockdown. Whenever I'm thinking, I feel so agitated, my body feels tight, I think, ah, I'm not really accepting the situation. So really bringing a sense of awareness into how you're feeling and just thinking, is, is this coming from resistance? And then doing a little bit of future pacing where you sort of ask yourself, like, if I kept feeling this way, where am I going to end up? Mm. So really understanding the cost of resistance in your life, I think, is a really great first step. And then the second, which we were just talking about is, is R for real. So all of my steps start with R to help you remember, but so just being real, it's just actually going, this is tough. This is so disappointing. This is heartbreaking and being honest with yourself and with other people and not seeing that as weakness. And I yeah. love Brene Brown's work around vulnerability and shame. And she talks about how vulnerability is strength. Yeah. It's she's not amazing, weakness. isn't she? Oh, amazing. Amazing. Mm. So, and like I said before, I think that the realness comes before resilience. So that's why it's there. And then the next step is about reframing. And this is about really looking for potential opportunities within the challenge. Yeah. And I was listening to a great podcast by the guy who runs the Resilience Project. And he was talking to Mia Friedman about the, the Melbourne lockdown. And he was saying that, he said, trying to fill the sentence of, if it wasn't for lockdown, I wouldn't have. And try and find something oh, really positive. Something positive, yeah. Which I loved that. And I'm aware that everyone's experience of lockdown is different. You know, I feel very privileged that my husband and I, the work we do can be done on a computer. I know that there are people who are really, really struggling. Yeah. And I preface what I say with that because I can only speak from, you know, my experience too. But but looking at what are the opportunities, what is the opportunity for growth, what can we learn from this, what can we let go of, what can we, you know, all those sorts of things um, just to really reframe. And then the fourth is around refocusing. 
so when we're in resistance, like I was saying before, we often focus on what we've lost, what we're sad about, what we're grieving, and we lose that sense of the wonder and the joy and the possibility in the present moment. So when we can refocus, it's about actually saying to ourselves, like, what is there to be grateful for? But even what is actually going well? You know, so saying, oh, well, I have a job that can be done remotely. Yeah. My goodness, I am one of the lucky, lucky ones. We're in a country that has vaccines. We are yeah. so lucky. So it again it goes back to that concept of perspective. But gratitude really changes the brain. Like it, it releases dopamine and wonderful things like that. But whatever we focus on, our brain sort of filters more of that in. So when we look for wonder and joy and, and gratitude, we see more of it. When yes. we focus on what we don't and all the things going wrong, which is why watching the news can be problematic, we just start to see it everywhere. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. One of the examples you gave in the article I read was, you know, if you're going to buy a new car, suddenly you notice that car everywhere. <laughs> and for me, what I, I remember so distinctly when I was pregnant for the first time, <laughs> it's like, oh, there are so many pregnant people around. <laughs> And now I feel like I never see them. So it's interesting how your brain filters things. Absolutely. I had th that same experience too. It's, it's really fascinating because, you know, our brain can't process everything that comes into our awareness in, in a day. And it filters based on what's important and what we're focusing on and obviously survival stuff as well. But, yeah, absolutely. The new car effect, the pregnant yeah. women effect. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's a fifth a fifth step that you've... Done. Yeah, so the, the fifth one is about rituals. So the, the thing around acceptance is that we're trying to combat this feeling of powerlessness and helplessness and lack of control, which we don't love as humans. And so ritual is actually really about helping you to, to provide these anchors in your day or in your week. So um, it could be even if you're working from home saying, okay, I'm still going to get dressed, yeah. you know, like I was going to work or at a certain time I go for a walk around the block. My husband and I have got a new little ritual this lockdown where on Sundays I have, have the morning to myself and I do an online meditation class and then I write my book for a few hours. Then we tag team and yes. he has his time in the afternoon um, to do whatever. And, you know, that's become a ritual for us, which is really helping our mental health and, you know, just really managing what can be, you know, a challenging situation. So really looking for those things that are going to fill up that wellness tank within yes. you. <laughs> yeah. And I think rituals are so important because like forming habits, when you have a ritual, it's something you do that you don't need to think about. So you're not sort of draining your willpower or anything yeah. like that. So my favorite ritual is I wake up really early before my children and husband wake up and I have my cup of coffee, I sit down, I meditate, there's no one else in the house and that sets my day up. So that's my little, that's a my favourite ritual. ritual. Yeah. And I think choosing a ritual that you can actually control is really good as well. That's not dependent too much on other people. Um, but that's a beautiful one. I like that. Yeah, so little rituals like, as you say, walking your dog or going for a walk around the block at the same time every day, um, dividing up the, your time with your husband, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Once we reach this place of empowered acceptance, what are the benefits then of that? I think the biggest one is this feeling that life isn't happening to you that you've sort of made that choice to go, this is happening and this is how I choose to respond and these are the rituals I'm going to incorporate and this is how I'm going to incorporate gratitude and I'm going to decide that this is what this period of my life means. So you're creating meaning and purpose. So it's really, again, taking ownership over your life amidst a situation that does feel quite challenging or where you do feel powerless. So that, that sense of freedom, that sense of reconnecting with your agency, your power, but also, you know, as we shift towards, you know, gratitude and connection, we're lowering our stress hormones, we're getting dopamine and oxytocin. And so we're literally changing that biology and those chemicals that um, make us feel better. So instead of being stuck in that, in that stressed place or that sad, you know, distressed place, which just isn't helpful for our bodies. It's amazing, isn't it, that 
we have a degree of control over our biology just by changing the way we think and frame things. Yeah. That's fascinating, I think. Incredible. Yeah. Jess, let's talk about your business, The Spark Effect. Yep. Which I love the name. It's a great (laughs) name. So you offer courses and corporate wellness programs. And you have a particular focus on working with female entrepreneurs. So before we chat about everything that you offer there, why did you decide to focus on helping women? Yeah, I am really passionate about helping more women to to share their knowledge because there's, I feel like we generally need more female voices in the world. Hear, hear. Uh, And I think over the years, myself included, I, you know, I've known that I've had some good ideas and that sort of sense of fear or like, oh, can I do it pops up and I haven't always followed through. And I see that a lot in other women, like yeah. truly brilliant women who know so much stuff that could help people that change conversations that really helps, you know, heal a lot of things that are happening in the world and they're not doing them. Um, for a lot of reasons, Mm. but that's where I'm really passionate about providing space and support and the the strategies around it to make sure that women who have a message and have knowledge to share get out there and share it because we need those voices in the world, 100%. We absolutely do. And I think um, speaking from the point of view of a woman, it's I find it very inspiring listening to other women share their knowledge. It just gives you a sense of possibility I think yeah definitely so tell us about then the um, spark effect academy the course that you offer yeah so this is a 12-week online program that's a personal and professional development program for female entrepreneurs but also females who see themselves as change makers because I work with with people who sometimes work in corporate and who just have this real drive to share something and so it's a, it's a program that looks at actually mindset mastery and message mastery. Mm-hmm. So like I was saying, what often happens along the creative journey is we have these ideas, but then we, we start procrastinating or we get stuck in perfectionism or we come up against imposter syndrome. And if we don't understand biologically, like why does our brain do this? Why do we get stuck in these things? We often can end up not moving forward, pulling back from the things we want to create and not sharing that wisdom and knowledge with the world. So my first thing about the Spark Effect Academy is actually saying, look, I want to tell you how your brain works, why these things happen. Procrastination is not about being lazy or being undisciplined. It is not. (laughs) Um, And really bringing this sense of awareness and self-compassion into the creative journey so that you know what mindset issues will come up and you've got solid science-based strategies to actually overcome them. Um, So that's a big part of it. And the second part around message mastery is actually saying, well, what is the project? What is the message that you actually want to put out there? Let's get clarity around that. And so I work one-on-one with people and each week they send me, you know, their work. It could be their course, their book. It could be a sales page they're working on. Um, And as a copywriter and communications person, I, you know, work with them on that as well. And so it's, it's this notion of not just wanting mindset work, but bringing in a project because yes. it's a bit like if we just have the mindset, it's like theory. You can sit and read a book and sure. go, oh, yes, I've mastered it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for me, it's so important. Like, so people who do my program come in with a project. So we're, we're actually doing the thing that you want to do alongside learning about the blocks and how to overcome them, which to me is the most powerful way to Absolutely. do this. Absolutely. That sounds great <laughs> because what you're providing um, is practical help, but also accountability because yes. I, it's very easy speaking for myself. And I'm sure a lot of other people find this to get lost in what's called productive procrastination. You know, you're doing <laughs> stuff, but it isn't really moving you towards your goal or what you're trying to achieve. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, we do, I do weekly calls for for 30 minutes where we we do that and we look at, I actually look at people's work and provide them with that personalised feedback, which also I think is quite unique because often in in programs, it's big group programs and you get lost in it all and um, I don't find that particularly helpful because, you know, it's not just accountability that keeps us stuck but not having someone to guide us and actually go... 
if you tweak that, if you change that, it's going to be ready to go. And that confidence builds as we can talk to somebody else. I just yeah. strong believer that we're not meant to do life or business on our own. <laughs> yeah. And also if you're launching something that's new to you, you, you might not quite know what the next step is. So some guidance and help, I can see how that would be really um, important for lots of women. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just very much about getting going, yeah, getting that momentum and actually knowing that you've got that support for, for the 12 weeks to know which blocks are going to come up, how to overcome them and actually get the project done, yeah, which great. is an incredible feeling. So I'll put a link to that, obviously, in the show notes. Can you share with us, and it can be totally anonymous, the kind of feedback that you've had from some people? Yeah, look, I think everyone who comes through the, the Spark Effect Academy always loves the neuroscience aspect because when we can understand ourselves better, everything opens up. Yes. You know, and the big shift is a lot more self-compassion. Women are very hard on themselves. They're yeah. often our worst critic, and that is a huge, huge issue. And so when I can explain, you know, why we do what we do and that it's actually your brain and how you're wired, not so much that, you know, like I said, not because you're lazy or undisciplined or whatever and really help people to understand why something's happening. There's this sense that the pressure comes down and there is more self-compassion. And interestingly, we create a lot better from that place. So they get more done. They enjoy it. And so that that sort of understanding of, of the brain is really, really useful. Some of them, you know, still message me, you know, a long time later and say, oh, I still go back to that masterclass or I've brought it into my workplace and we talk about these things, these strategies that you've shared, all these concepts. And, of course, just that support and accountability because, um, yeah, I really come in with a big heart to to help my clients and, and help them move forward in a way that's not that boot camp style yes, coaching. Yeah. That's not me at all. Um you know, I, I really aim to keep people in what I call the sweet spot of challenge right. where they're challenged, but not so far that they're moving into any anxiety or panic. So yep. a lot of the coaching is about helping them to, to sort of up their game a bit sometimes, or actually, you know, really break things down so that they're just feeling in a really great space to create. Um, yeah. So I think those two things, you know, the knowledge and then having my one-on-one -on -one support and yep. guidance, especially around the the messaging as well. Well, that sounds great. And I think for women, a lot of us have so much, you know, stored up in our brains all the time. I feel like I've got five people's lives in my head at any one moment. So, you know, sometimes it's hard to create space. So yes. it sounds like you help kind of navigate through that as well. Yeah. And I think just knowing when you've committed to, to doing a project, to know that for this period of time, someone's on my team <laughs> and there is a place to go to have all those questions answered. Like you say, it just frees up that headspace. Yeah. And also having your eyes looking over something, you know, brings a fresh perspective as well. And I think when you're sort of burrowed down into some kind of uh, work or something you're trying to create, you can, I think, lose perspective. Yeah, definitely. We all, we all do that. It's very hard to to yeah, create without that outside eyes in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, when you're living and breathing something, you know, you do need a bit of a reality check, I suppose. <laughs> what else do you offer apart from the Spark Effect Academy training? You do, yep. I believe you do corporate training as well? Yep. So I've also got another course, which is called the Course Creation Accelerator Program. So that was specifically aimed for people who wanted to do an online course. I've got an upcoming book, which um, I'm, I'm working on, oh, which fantastic. is titled Called to Create, which is very much the similar message of the Spark Effect Academy about saying yes to that, <laughs> that, that call to share a message and overcome the challenges to get there. So that's exciting. Corporate wellness, I haven't been doing as much of that with uh, no, <laughs> the COVID sure you lockdown. No, I'm haven't. But um, yeah, working, working with teams, like I've done some work with Combank and NAB and Blackmores just to help their teams again understand how the brain works, how to manage stress, how to think creatively, how to work better. That whole concept of working smarter, not harder is, is a big one. Yeah. So that's been quite fun. Um, and, yeah, I've got a blog on my website and I've done community programs and speaking in the past. So that's brilliant. Gosh, you've, you've certainly got a lot on your plate. And when you think back to how unwell you were, it's actually amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, 
I am very grateful. I'm very grateful for for the recovery. And interestingly, though, I'm, I'm also a big believer that through the work I've done, it is part of my healing. Because if you've if you look at any work on the flow state, there's a lot of literal healing that happens in the body when we get into that beautiful state. And for me, writing and coaching and helping others, it, that's my happy place. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, well done. I mean, obviously you've worked hard at it. Just, just to wrap up, so how would you say that COVID has impacted your work? I mean, obviously you said the corporate wellness programs are not proceeding at the moment. So what about some other ways? Yeah, so I, I guess the, the positive is people are much more okay about Zoom and yeah. online, which so it's not been a barrier in that sense. Um, probably the biggest challenge I've got now is we've kept our son home from daycare through the lockdown periods. And so I used to have three days um, solid to do work and I don't have any now. <laughs> so I'm also up early with my coffee ritual like you you two, um, but doing some work. So I've had to, you know, pull back a bit from my workload with this lockdown. But like I was saying with the flip side, I, I just... Um, see that as a huge you know potential because my my little guy's only four and it's a very precious time oh, so I'm seeing I'm seeing that as a real positive rather than seeing having to pull back from some work as a negative so so that's probably been the biggest thing is just my time um is a bit more divided but that's not always a bad thing. Uh, when we have less time, we actually get super focused on the most important things. <laughs> yes. I mean, isn't there a saying, if you want something done, give it to the busiest person? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And also I think having that wonderful time with your son, you will never regret that. That, that'll, you know, no. wonderful. Mm. No. So yeah. So maybe that's a, the good thing from, yeah, from the, lockdown, the silver lining. Sure. Yes. So, Jess, who inspires you? Oh, look, I have always been inspired by people who overcome adversity, always. I've yeah. my, been a huge fan of, you know, Australian Story was my <laughs> favourite show oh, for a amazing. very long time. But, yeah, so, you know, I love, um, I'm a huge fan of Jill Hicks. I recently interviewed her for, for an article. You know, she survived a London terrorist attack yes. and, you know, incredible woman. Um, I'm also a big fan of creatives as she is one as well. So I love people like Ando who mix. Oh, he's amazing. You know, <laughs> he's so cool. And um, I love Elizabeth Gilbert, people who are really out there, you know, inspiring creativity and possibility and optimism in people. So, um, but also like on a more like everydayness level, I, I, I'm inspired by like people like my clients who actually do say yes to say, I actually have something to share and I'm going to be brave enough to step into that space and do it. And I find that really inspiring. So yeah, people are out there who want to make a change. Oh, that's brilliant. Jess, my final question. I like to ask all my guests this, if you could recommend two things that people could do to improve their well-being, what would they be? So the first thing I think of is about choosing your focus which I've spoken about today. Yep. But there's a quote that I love from Arthur Ashe, which says, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And I think whenever we come back to that is just to go, what is my capacity in this moment? And just start there. And there'll always be some capacity that we can do to feel a little bit better, to share with somebody or to something to make us feel better. And that really shifts us into that mindset of possibility and abundance rather than scarcity. So focus yeah. is really important. Mm -hmm. The second thing I think, and I say this particularly in relation to what we're all going through at the moment, is actually around gratitude. And so really asking that question of what is what are some of the good things here? Because otherwise we get lost yeah. in, the, in the bigness and the difficultness and the sadness of stuff. So gratitude is really important. And I sort of feel like that's quite tied into being outdoors I was going to write that as my second one because I think when you're outdoors you actually very easily connect with gratitude absolutely but you can also connect gratitude through journaling and and things like that but yeah I do think being outside once a day connects you to that gratitude that sense of wonder in nature and perspective so choosing your focus and being in nature and connecting to gratitude I think as much as possible yeah, well, that's wonderful advice. So thank you so much. It's been a real honor to chat with you today. So if people want to follow you, and I'll put all this in the show notes, but what's the best place for them to look at what you're doing? 
Yeah, so you can come over to the website, which is thesparkeffect.com.au. I'm also on Instagram, which is the underscore spark underscore effect. Um, and also you can search for The Spark Effect on Facebook. So, yeah, Brilliant. it'd be lovely to, to connect with some of your listeners. That would thank be you, really Jess. lovely. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. That was Jessica Lee, neuro wellbeing writer and educator, sharing her tips about empowered acceptance, that is, about how to accept rather than resist unwanted change in our circumstances, such as illness or lockdown, and find meaning and purpose in our lives. I think this is an episode relevant to people living in lockdown or having their usual freedoms curtailed by the COVID-19 pandemic. I sincerely hope that you found my chat with Jess both helpful and practical. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast and tell your friends about it. And if you could take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts, it will help people find my podcast and I would really appreciate that. You can follow me at Instagram on vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast or on Facebook at Vibrant Lives Podcast. Very excitingly, the launch of my new website is imminent. It will be easier to navigate and it will have some excellent wellbeing recommendations. Also, I'll be creating a community of like-minded people who want to learn about living a healthy, fulfilling and vibrant life. So please watch this space. Thank you for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.